Hi, and welcome to Exploring Old Maps. Today we're going to look at the Monklands and Kirk and Tillich Railway, the Glasgow and Garnkirk Railway, and a bit of background to that with the Monklands Canal. I'm Ross Maynard, and I hope you enjoy this video. Before we proceed too far, I just want to make a few notes in terms of copyright. The old maps that we're going to look at are from the National Library of Scotland website, and they are shared with permission of the National Library of Scotland under the Creative Commons by Attribution license. We'll also look at some open street map data, and that's also shared under Creative Commons by Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license, and the, the reference there is Copyright OpenStreetMap Contributors, and there's a website address there. The modern maps that we see are mainly copyright of Microsoft, and they are not licensed for commercial use, one of the reasons why this is a free video, and you'll have to ex seek express permission if you're planning to use any of these maps for um, commercial purposes. And finally, the ship's bell sound at the beginning there, that's by Mike Koenig of soundbible.com and is also used under Creative Commons license 3.0. Right, we're going to get started with the Monkland Canal first, because I want to give a bit of background history before talking about the two railway lines. Now, at the end of the 1700s, the Industrial Revolution was beginning to take hold, and the demand for coal in Glasgow was rising. That meant the price of coal was rising rapidly and traders and manufacturers and others were extremely unhappy about that. Plentiful coal was available in the Lanarkshire coal mines, which were only 10 to 12 miles away, but the transport by horse and cart was very expensive and very slow. So the answer seemed to be to build a canal. Canals were very popular in the 1700s. And work started on the Monkland Canal in June 1770. It was managed by the famous James Watt, but he experienced many difficulties with construction and he left the project in 1773, presumably to continue his interest in steam engines. Seven miles had been completed at that point. The Monkland Canal finally reached Cope Bridge in 1794, 24 years after it had been started even though it's only 12 miles long. Once it was opened though, the price of coal in Glasgow dropped dramatically. So let's have a look at the map for the Monkland Canal. All right, let's have a look at the wonderful National Library of Scotland side-by-side -side mapping. Website address there is given at the top of the page, maps.nls.uk, and then you can navigate to side-by-side -side mapping. On our left, we have the old map from the city of Glasgow, which is where we're going to start. This is the Ordnance Survey one inch to one mile map, 1885 to 1900. We'll have a quick look at what other maps are available in a second. On the right, we have our modern map, which is Microsoft Bing Maps, and these are copyright Microsoft Corporation. Okay for personal use, but not for commercial use. Right, we start with the city of Glasgow, and just before we can use these drop-down menus here to look at all sorts of different maps. So I often use here the six inch to one mile map from 1888 to 1913, which as we zoom in gives us much better detail. And we can see both maps zoom in together, but we've also got plenty of other scope. We've got a 25 inch map here, which is rather interesting. We'll zoom in on that in a moment. We have maps from 1937 to 61 here, so that gives us a different view. This is the area that we're going to be starting in, Port Dundas, for the start of the Monkland Canal. We can zoom ahead again. Uh, what we've got there, Ordnance Survey 1920s. Interesting. And right forward to 1949 to 1968. Again, Port Dundas. A bit more zooming in there as we start to look at the start of the canal. We can see it there. Um, what else we've got? We've got 7 Series 1955 as well. Spring Bank, it's now being called. Okay, so let's jump back. Let's go with this 1892 map. And we can see here at the start 
No, we're not going to do that. The picture's not that good, is it? The start of the Monkland Canal. Originally it came here to where Port Dundas is marked. But later it was extended to meet with the Forth and Clyde Canal, which is just up here. Right, and we're going to switch to the 6-inch map because I find that gives a good level of detail and enables us to see things. And here we are. This is the Forth and Clyde Canal along here, which goes all the way to the Firth of Forth near Grangemouth. And here we have the Monkland Canal going down the bottom here. Now this extension to the Forth and Clyde Canal was built a few years after the main part of the canal. But it seemed useful to join the two canals together. Right, so moving along the Monkland Canal, we move down and we see on the modern map Partick Thistle Football Ground, which clearly wasn't there on the 1888 map. So if we jump forward a little bit, let's look at 1937-61, I bet it's on there there. Yes, there we have the football ground there. So at some point in the early 1900s, is there another one? Let's see if that's on that one. Not there on the 1900s map, so between 1900-1910, whatever, Firhill football ground was built, and the canal runs right past it. Let's jump back to the 6-inch map and continue our journey along. We can see there's a lot of industrial site here, and we come to Port Dundas, and there was originally, if we zoom in a bit, a whiskey distillery here, which is very interesting. And I know that some of these properties are still owned by Diageo, um, who were United Distillers. So that's obviously where the sources of that come from. Zoom out a second. And here we see where the Edinburgh to Glasgow main line, still the main line, comes in. And the line goes down to Queen Street Station, which is down here at the bottom. Now, we see that Queen Street Station is on there on the 1888 map, but it certainly wasn't there back when the Monkland and Kirk and Tillock Railway was built or the Glasgow and Gernkirk Railway was built. The terminus for them was up here, which is was called Buchanan Street Station and is now on Cowcaddens Road. And there used to be a Scott Rail offices up there, and I always wondered why it was far away from Queen Street Station. Well, it seems like the railway probably owned the land from its origins as Buchanan Street Station. I believe there's a network rail office is still in that building, a modern building. Anyway, coming back to the canal, the Monkland Canal, we see here, let's zoom in a second, the chemical works. This was Charles Tennant's chemical works, and we'll come back to Charles Tennant later. He was very influential in the development of of the Glasgow and Gown Kirk Railway. The land now, as we can see on the right hand side, is being cleared. It used to be where the site till flats were, they've been blown up and they're building modern housing there now. Also just over to the right, we see the famous St. Rollock's works on this 1888 map. Of course, they weren't there when the Glasgow and Gown Kirk or Monklands and Kirk and Tillock railways were built, but they were very famous um, railway works. Now, as we can see, that's a Tesco Superstore, that's a Costco large warehouse, I believe that's a Royal Mail Depot. So, plenty of stuff going on there now. Industrial works back in the 1800s. Zooming out for a second, we begin to see that on the modern maps, the Monkland Canal is buried under the M8 motorway. We have lost it at this point here where these basins are. The modern motorway has been built right over the top of the Monkland Canal. One day somebody will dig up the M8 and find the Monkland Canal right underneath it. Anyway, if we follow the route of the Monkland Canal, we see it's under the M8, continues to be under the M8, big works at Block N, which is now another industrial estate. The M8 is exactly following the line of the Monkland Canal, which is really quite spooky, isn't it? There's railway lines there, which again were more recent than Glasgow and Gernkirk or Monkland and Kirk and Tillock. And we follow the route round and the M8 is still following right over the top of the Monkland Canal. Something of a shame, slightly ironic. Modern road transport has beaten old canal transport. We follow it along there, still on the line of the M8 motorway. 
and we follow along, still following the motorway, Glasgow Fort Shopping Centre in what was Fields back in the 1800s. Still following the M8, the canal. There is the canal coming through. Oh, and there we begin to see where it's broken away. The M8 heads a bit further south, but the canal here is along this line of trees. Now, if we zoom in, onto this line of trees, we're going to see that we don't see any water. The canal is filled in. There may be a bit of a track that you could possibly follow along, but there ain't no canal there anymore, which is rather sad. Follow it round. Old shaft up there, long gone. Follow it round, crosses what is now the M74 canal, about there where this gullet was. Again, still filled in. We can see the line following these line of trees, so there might be something there to be seen, a filled in canal bed. But, but no canal, I'm afraid. But the canal's going to start again fairly soon. There we go. So there we see the canal starting again, and this bit again is navigable and walkable along. So it's been filled in up to this point, and it's going to continue most of the way to Cope Bridge. There is the direct Glasgow and Cope Bridge line, which was built um, quite a few years after the Glasgow and Gernkirk line as a more direct route. Here we follow the canal again, we see it. Some sort of junction going on here once upon a time. wonder if there's anything in those trees. Drumpellier Quarry, that was. Uh, collier, colliery, that was. Here we go, Monkland Canal along here on the old map. There it is on the new map. Following it round, another quarry there. Tunnel Pit. Now, I don't know, that looks like allotments have been built on it. I bet it's probably not safe to build houses on that. Crossing over and then we lose the canal again on the modern map, but there it is still on the old map. And if we flip to OpenStreetMap, which is another useful source licensed under Creative Commons, we can see the line, the blue line here shows that there must be a path going through, still following the line of where the canal was. We can also look at the Ordnance Survey open data. This is publicly available OS data and the mapping is not as good as the OS maps that you buy. All right, let's jump back to Bing Hybrid. Follow the line of where the canal was, comes up there. West Canal Street, so obviously was on the canal, but a bit of green space, probably paths that you can walk your dog along. And then we completely lose it. And this all around here has been filled in. That bit along there is now the South Circular Road. Let's zoom out just a little bit. Um, this up here has also been filled in, but trees and so on. So maybe uh, modern railway line. Yep, there's the railway line there. The canal filled in next to it. Bit of industrial park, bit of woodland, etc. Um, so nothing to be seen of the canal now in modern Cope Bridge, which is rather sad. I'll just go down and follow this bit here. Yep, that's a retail park, Faraday Retail Park, where the North British Iron Works was. And the canal continued along here past all these foundries and ironworks, many of which wouldn't have been there when the canal was built. And we can see where it's been filled in. It's rather a shame. Following it round here, oops, looks, oh yeah, still track, so we can still see bits of it in the track, Monkland Canal, track down there. If we just quickly jump to OpenStreetMap, North Calder Heritage Trail. So there's a trail now, a heritage trail that follows along the line of where the canal was. And we're soon going to join into the river. Yep, there we go. There we join back to the canal. The trail follows along beside it. Go to the hybrid map. Yep, following along. There we can see 
and as soon as we get to North Calder, which is just around here, it's dismantled railway along there, sort of see signs in the aerial map, probably can't see much on the ground. Um, and we skim around here, there's another colliery up there, long gone. Quarry and shafts here, and we're now in the North Calder water, so it's reverted to being a river as it was. Yep, at Calder Bank. So the canal has become lost in the river. And that's about all. I'm just going to have a last look on Open Street, see what it says. Yep, the pathway is still following it along there, which is good. Okay, that's all we have to say on the Monkland Canal. We'll come back in a second for the Monkland and Kirkentillock Railway. Right, the Monkland Canal is in operation now and is extremely profitable. So now we come to look at the Monkland and Kirkentillock Railway. Of course, the Monkland Canal now had the monopoly on the transport of coal and other goods into Glasgow from the Lanarkshire pits. This dissatisfied the pit and foundry owners who found the charges exorbitant, and they decided to build a railway from their coal mines and foundries which were in the Cope Bridge area, to the Forth and Clyde Canal at Kirk and Tillock, a distance of about 10 miles. The line was built in only two years and opened in 1826 using horse-drawn wagons. Passenger services along the line started around 1828. The Monklands and Kirk and Tillock Railway was the first railway in Scotland to use a steam locomotive, used from around May 1831 and closely followed by the Glasgow and Kirk, as we'll see later. The building of the line led to the great expansion of the town of Coke Bridge. It had 17 blast furnaces in 1826, and that increased to 53 blast furnaces in 1843. However, the line began to decline later in the 19th century as other more direct routes were built, and is now, apart from a couple of junctions, completely derelict. And you join us for the Monkland and Kirk and Tillock Railway on the railscot.co.uk website, useful website for giving us information about old railway lines, particularly in Scotland, and locations. And we see here that um, the Act for the Railway was passed in 1824 and the railway was opened in 1826, so quite a quick construction and that William Baird & Co were one of the main contractors. Very famous company in the Glasgow area and north of Glasgow, owner of mines and quarries and all sorts of things back in the 1800s. And the Railscot page gives us some information that we can um, look at, gives some photos there, um, and gives us information about the timeline of the route and so on. I'm not going to go into this in detail. You can look at the web page if you want to, but some of the remains, which is basically a footpath nowadays for much of it, as we'll see, of the railway. Very little remains of the Monkland and Kirk and Tillock railway now. You can follow it on cycle or on foot for some of the route, um, but a lot of the route is, is, is lost. And there we go. It talks about each of the steps all the way through to Garchery, which is on the edge of Coatbridge, and then Sunnyside, which is in Coatbridge, as we'll see from the mapping. So let's jump into National Library of Scotland again, side by side mapping. And we're at the little town of Kirk and Tillock, just north of Glasgow, about seven miles north of Glasgow, and the beginning of the Monkland and Kirk and Tillock Railway. And the beginning was this basin here on the Forth and Clyde Canal. The idea behind the railway was to bring the coal and other products from the pits around the Coatbridge area to the Forth and Clyde Canal where they could be transported down south to Glasgow or north and east through to the Firth of Forth, Edinburgh and so on. So this is the beginning of the Monkland and Kirk and Tillet Railway, now a business park as we see South Bank Business Park. We also see a railway line going up here. This is a much later railway line built in the mid 1800s, perhaps even in the late 1800s, I think. Goes through to Lennox Town and Strathblane and a branch goes up through Kilsyth to Bonnybridge. 
later routes, never particularly successful, rather remote country with fewer mines and so on. But we're here to follow the Monkland and Kirkintilloch. So let's have a look. There goes the line down here on the old map, the 1888 map. Let's have a quick look on the 25 inch map as it loads. Yep. There we go. And we're going to be able to follow it quite soon. It goes past White Gates Business Park there on what is now a road. What's it called? Marina Way. And still Lenzie Road here. It's crossing here and then we can see here some sort of path this is where the cycle path stops or starts even behind these houses here i'm going to go back to the six inch map because i think that's given us a little better view actually and there we begin to come there's the railway route going down there as we can see i'll zoom in just a wee bit a loop there constructed. Oh, we can still see the track of that as well as a path to join on with the more modern line when that was built. And there is our mineral line, which is a footpath or cycle path between these rows of what is now houses, what was then fields. And there's the line following through here. And this is the modern road. So it's crossing the road. Was it crossing the road? round about here which is all gone which is all trees it should be able to find traces but this is certainly a path that you can cycle along or uh, walk along let's have a look at open street map show us the dotted line of the path yep here we go we're following the path it's lost a bit here because this is a new road but there's a path coming through here and then we can begin to follow it on this side too Okay, modern road has obscured parts of it, but there we see the track coming, and then there it is down there, and this can still be followed, as I say. I'm just going to go to open street map again for a bit. Yep, there it is along there. Still coming along here beside this, this little river stream. Along there, this is all still a footpath, a cycle path, so we can easily access this. We can follow the line along. There was a branch up to um, a colliery just a bit further north there. Um, and But this our line at Monkland and Kirk until it continues. And this is where we cross what is the modern M8. And you can see a footbridge there so we can still cross the road it still is a public path um, that crosses the road and follows the line of the track so we can continue to follow the line of the track interesting that says tomb right there i wonder what that is i don't think this zoom is going to show us anything is it no And we continue through industrial areas here, but we can still see the path there going along behind these houses, old quarry there with houses built on it now. Um, here's the railway line. We can see it through the trees there. We can still follow it, still following the stream, following the river, following it down. Bedley Cemetery we see it's crossed Cumbernauld Road here looks like we'd have to look right and left and cross the road but it's still it's still there and if we look on the open street map yeah we can still see the dotted path the dotted line of the path there and here we lose a dotted line for a bit I'm sure I've Oh yes, this is where it ends. So we can access the path right up until this road here. What's that called? Avenue Head Road. But this is fenced off. You can see the, the sort of track continuing, but it's all fenced off. It is a former quarry and clay pit and sand works, as we can see all around here. And I have a bit of, I get the eebie-jeebies about quarries and mines, so I've never actually accessed this. Um, and we can see that the modern M73 comes through here. So the railway line crossed it. We can sort of see on the aerial photo there that it's crossing it, but 
there's not really much visible. But we pick it up again very shortly down this track here. We can begin to see that track there. If we zoom out just a second, we see it continue and we can pick it up again there. If we look on open street data, open street map, we can see the path continuing. So the path is back. We can follow it again, go back to being, continue to follow it down here across this post-industrial derelict landscape down here and then we're beginning to get into land which was old quarries and collieries. Inchnock Tower remains of in ruins. Doesn't look like there's anything now. Past the fire clay works, past the fire clay pit here. Lots of works used to be on this land which is now derelict. But we can see the line of the track coming down here. Coming down here, crossing this main track, which is probably the main Cote Bridge line. Yeah, it looks like the lines are joining here. Um, still a track there down below, we can see, and this is where it joins into what is the Caledonian Railway. Obviously, that wasn't there back in when the Monkland and Kirk and Tillock was built, because it was the first railway built in this area. Um, and the line is now still running line. So we're on the running line, which is the original track of the Monkland and Kirk and Tillock. Let's zoom out just a wee bit. Pass more fire clay works. So lots of clay in this land to be had. And then we come in here, still now modern track following the line of the old. And now much more densely populated with railway, as we'll see in a second when we look at the Glasgow and Gernkirk. And we're coming into Garchery here, which is where all these iron works, all these chemical works, all these pits were built as a result of the Monkland and Kirkland Kirk and Tillock Railway being built. And this is where it ended. It ended at Sunnyside, so it must have looped round here. It's not as evident on this old map. Let's quickly jump to the 25 inch map, see if it gives us any more. Not really. It probably zoomed across there, didn't it? Gart Sherry Road as it now is to get to Sunnyside. But that is where the line ended. Well, it didn't end because there were branches up into the collieries, but that was the, when the passenger services started. That would be the terminus. Okay, and that is the Monkland and Kirk and Tillock, as we can see. Um, it was the dawn of the railway age for this part of Scotland, one of the very first lines in Scotland. The first line was steam locomotive and it opened up the coal fields of Lanarkshire. Price of coal in Glasgow dropped dramatically. And finally, we come to the Glasgow and Garnkirk Railway. The inventor and entrepreneur Charles Tennant, who was the pioneer of the bleaching of textiles, he owned the largest chemical factory in the world at St Rollox in Glasgow. And by 1832, it was consuming 30,000 tonnes of coal a year. Keen to reduce the costs of his supply, he became the chief sponsor of the Glasgow and Garnkirk Railway, which would bring coal from the Cote Bridge area directly into Glasgow, and by a coincidence, of course, passing his factory, a distance of around eight miles. Construction on the line started in 1827 and the line opened in 1831. It introduced a steam locomotive, which was built by Robert Stevenson in June 1831, so just one month after the Monklands and Kirk and Tillock Railway. The line was reliant on the Monklands and Kirk and Tillock Railway for access for some of the best coal fields in Lanarkshire, and the two lines worked in close partnership for a number of years. As we'll see from the maps, the two lines join near Cote Bridge itself. Other lines were built to exploit the vast Lanarkshire and West Lothian coal fields, and in 1840 it became possible to travel between Edinburgh and Glasgow by rail, though you had to take a boat from Edinburgh up the Union Canal to Linlithgow to start that journey. The journey took around four hours, and it used the Glasgow and Garnkirk Railway from Cote Bridge into Glasgow for that stretch of the journey. 
However, in 1842, the direct Edinburgh to Glasgow railway opened and this destroyed passenger traffic along this much more circuitous route. The Glasgow and Garnkirk Railway was leased by the Caledonian Railway in 1846 and fully amalgamated with it in 1865. Much of this route is still in use by railway for the line from Glasgow Queen Street to Coatbridge via Steps and Garkosh, as we will see from the maps. So let's go looking at the maps now. And we start our journey along the Glasgow and Garnkirk Railway on the website railmaponline.com, which shows all the historic lines in the UK. And we're just going to give an overview here. We can see these were all the lines constructed. So later beyond the Garnkirk and Glasgow, many, many lines were constructed. As we can see here, all of these little offshoots and things will be collieries and foundries and all sorts of things in the Lanarkshire coal field, which is here, through into West Lothian up here. Loads and loads of old lines to be seen. But just to show the route of our line, Firstly, the Monkland and Kirk and Tillock Railway ran from Kirk and Tillock here. There's the end of it. And it ran all through here, through what's now called Moody's Burn, down into Coatbridge down here. So that's that line that we saw earlier. And the Garnkirk and Glasgow line runs from Glasgow's in the blue here. It runs from the north of Glasgow around here. And is this line here that follows through steps what's now called Garkosh and so on into Coatbridge. And later all these further extensions were built as the railway age took, took hold. If we quickly jump onto railscot.co.uk, we can again see some information about the line opened on 27th of May, 1831, um, as I said earlier. And um, the, this website gives some, some further information, should you wish to look it up. Um, some much more recent photos of steam engines on various parts of the line. Rob Royston there in Glasgow, modern trains there. Much of this line, most of this line, is still in use for the modern line through steps to Coatbridge, as we will see. I mentioned earlier also that in 1831, the Garnkirk and Glasgow took delivery of a locomotive built by Robert Stevenson and it was a planet type locomotive of this type here. This picture is from Wikipedia. Interesting. Okay, let's jump to the maps. So we're back at National Library of Scotland map, side by side mapping, and we're in the Port Dundas area of Glasgow. Charles Tennant's chemical works is around here somewhere. Run find it. just off here isn't it yeah there we go chemical works so Charles Tennant's chemical works was here right near the canal he was concerned that the Monkland canal had a monopoly on the coal coming in and he was consuming a lot of coal in his chemical works so he was one of the chief sponsors of the Glasgow and Garnkirk and here we see it coming into Glasgow right beside his chemical works I'm sure that was an absolute coincidence and it went into Glasgow and terminated at the Town Head Station, which is here, um, which is now offices, as we can see. And as I said earlier, there's a network rail office, I think, in that modern building on the corner there, which presumably the railway still has some holdover. And there is Glasgow Queen Street Station, which was built later as the main terminus for the Edinburgh to Glasgow line, and now also the line that follows the route of our Galkirk to Glasgow line. Okay, so there is a beginning and it's lost in all this derelict land which was once Site Hill Flats and has now been redeveloped for housing. It goes past what became St Rollock's Railway Works but obviously wasn't there when the railway was built. Now a big shopping retail park, very large Tesco there and there it intersects with all sorts of other lines which were built after our railway. And we begin to come out of Glasgow now, following the line of the track there, which is, as we can see, modern railway. It's all modern railway. It's still very much in use, this line, which is a fitting complement, I think. 
and there we see it following it up. There's Rob Royston there. I'm on the edge of Glasgow, swooping around here, disused mineral line there. We can still see a trace of it coming into the motorway. I think that's the M80 there, yes, M80. And into steps. Now we see here that steps on the old map, the 1880 map, is spelt with one P. Steps nowadays is spelt with two P's. And there's the modern step station there, which was a railway carriage shed back in the day. The old original station was here, just where it intersects the road. I wonder if anything is evident there in the ground. Can't see any structures from the satellite map. Let's quickly flick to the 25 inch map, see what it shows us. Yes, it shows us platforms, um, but nothing on the. It's a very jump to the open street data, open street map. No, it's not showing anything. Four to nineteen thirty-seven map. Yep, station's still there. Jump forward to nineteen forty-four map. <clears throat> yep, station's still there by the road. And jump forward finally to the seventh series. We'll jump, go by that one, shall we? Yep, station's still there on the 1949 map. Jump forward to 1955. It's a different scale, so I have to zoom out a bit, but station's still there. So that modern station is fairly recent. Anyway, let's go back to the six inch continue to follow the line. It became called the Glasgow Garnkirk and Coatbridge line as it was extended, but its original route is what we're following. There's Garnkirk and the fire clay works as were now some sort of industrial site by the looks of it. Coming back around another fire clay works, loads and loads of clay in this land we can see as we saw also on the other line. Garkosh clay works also later became a famous steel works. Let's see if we can see that in a more forward map. Garkosh, no, that's deep, not detailed enough, that one. Can't really see very well. There's Garkosh works, so that's where the steel works was in Garkosh by the 1940s. Let's go back the way. Yep, back. Ah, oh, there it is. In fact, it's still there on the 1888 map. And we're following the line of the track. I'll zoom out just a wee bit. This loop loops round to join onto the track going northbound out of Coatbridge. And in fact, if we scroll up a bit, we can see the Monkland and Kirk and Tillock line, or what was it, coming in there past the fire clay works and joining up with our line just a bit further down. As we see, there's our line. And that's where the two lines join down here. So the Glasgow and Garnkirk railway people were dependent on the Monkland and Kirk and Tillock to give them access to all the clay pits, all the coal mines, all the iron works that were in Coatbridge and in the extended area. And then we're into Coatbridge again and all all the, the lines that were there. There's a little uh, railways. There's a map. One of these map options gives us railways somewhere. There we go. So we can see the extent of railways that there were in the area. And if we jump back to rail map online and zoom out just a wee bit, we can see all the old railways. All of these in red are now gone. The ones in blue still exist. Um, the main line is also coming through. Where is it? Yep, through here. The main Glasgow Edinburgh line is through Croy, Bishop Briggs, through to Edinburgh. I mentioned also that in 1840, the, Gla the Garnkirk and Glasgow joined up with the Slammanen line so that you could travel from Edinburgh to Glasgow in four hours. You had to come out of Edinburgh, which is through here, and you had to follow the Union Canal. So you took a boat along the Union Canal, which is not marked on this map, sadly, to Linlithgow, which is about here. And then you joined the line 
coming through here, this is the line here, through, through, through to Coat Bridge, where you joined the Glasgow and Garnkirk and took it through to Glasgow. Of course, that was knocked on the head as soon as the main line, Edinburgh to Glasgow, was built, which is this line up here. And the journey time nowadays takes about 15 minutes. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much for listening. Watch back again for another video.